Arun, thank you very much. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the IAC. So thank you very much again. Um, I took several years to write this book, not because it was so convoluted, but because I wasn't disciplined, and also because it wouldn't come. Certain revelations about characters, it took time for it to emerge. So at the risk of sounding like Joan of Arc, I would wait for the voices uh, to come and the characters to appear and tell their backstories. Um, it's for Ailey's. Ailey is short for Eliamma, which is Elizabeth in my mother tongue, which is Malayalam. So the book is about a community called the Syrian Christians. It has nothing to do with ISIS. <laughs> we were um, converted in the first century AD by St. Thomas the Apostle, um, the direct, and uh, we are the direct descendants of those who were converted from the Brahminical faith into Christianity. So much of our customs have remained Hindu customs. Much of our dress has remained Hindu too. The language we speak, my mother tongue, is that of the Hindus and the Muslims in our state. So this is the background. And contrary to the rest of the society of Kerala, the Syrian Christians belong to a patriarchal society. Until recently, we had a dowry system. So Ajit always grumbles he never got anything from me. Uh, and there was also the women couldn't inherit property. The four Ailies in my book have, a say, have the same name because we have the custom that the eldest son is named after the paternal uh, grandfather. The eldest daughter is named after the paternal grandmother. So in one family, there would be several people called the same name. So that's why there are four of them here. I have chosen to construct the book like a, a, a frame, in a frame, because much of the center of the book are tumultuous memories, which a child recalls um, when she sits down on a tombstone and remembers her past after she becomes an adult. And she changes her name from Ailey to Elizabeth, which it really is Elizabeth in English. And so the, the, most of the book is recalling, and then it loops back to the end of the frame where she's back at the tombstone. So many of the prominent families of the community had huge vaults in which the bodies were kept. Remember Romeo and Juliet? So the bodies are kept inside, interred there, and the family are put in there. The girls who are married off are not allowed to come back to their father's tombs. So they're very elaborate rooms uh, below the f uh, ground where they are interred. So the opening scene which I'm going to read to you about is the beginning of the frame of the book where Elizabeth goes back after many years to Kalam, which is a thinly disguised name for Kotim, which I didn't want to use the actual names, so I created, recreated a mythical Kerala. So I'm going to read from that part now. <coughs> Elizabeth looked around the familiar graveyard. <coughs> Nothing had changed here. She climbed onto the platform and sat on the cement floor, which hid the flat marble slab which lay over the entire room below. At one end stood an upright headstone, double her height. Only if she stepped far, far back could she see it was a cross, fat and curvy. She read the list of names in white on the black marble panel. It gave no information about the buried, not even the year each was born or the year they died, only names. Women's in one row and men's in another. One presumed in order of their dates of death. Among the many women's names lay the name Ailey, written several times. Three of them were part of her story. Her name would be there one day. Though the sun was hot on her back, she shivered. Her eyes closed. The cement floor tilted, and down she slid through golden vapors, so lightly down through the dust moats into the cavern. Elizabeth is listening. 
Here they all lie, here, swirling about when the tomb slab lifts and the air drifts in, otherwise lying in intermingled layers, brothers and sisters, uncles and lovers, husbands and wives and brothers-in-law. And here, her mother lies, who waited now in eternity to hear her daughter say the goodbye she refused to say when she was alive. Bye, Amma, she said now into the silence. Come back, listen to me, she commanded the dead. She scrambled on the cement flooring and pulled at one iron handle, trying to rest it open. Come back, I want to say goodbye. Tears and mucus dampened and stained her sari. It would show on TV when her team watched her speak to the admiring thousands. But no one, not even she, noticed. So that's the beginning bit and she goes on a little bit and then there's a flashback to when she's a child. And one thing she always wanted as a child, for some reason, was a monkey. For her, families were very important, and in lieu of a sibling, she thought what she wanted was a monkey. <laughs> she had set her heart on one from the time at Vayu at Heart's Ease Estate, when for one precious, tantalizing day, she had had a monkey of her own. The multi-bedroom estate house sat on top of an incline. The trim lawns of the garden ran seamlessly into the rough and tumble of the wild grasses and flowering shrubs which waved into the tall trees and bamboo clumps of the forest. Little Ailey never really saw the old man emerge from the forest cover. She always saw him outside the veranda that ran around the front of the huge estate house. He sat silent and waited to be noticed. Tiny yellow dogs with jalebi tails trotted at his heels. The man crouched down. By his side stood a cane basket covered with fresh banana leaves. He smiled at little Ailey and took out a bottle and held it out to her. His head bobbed up and down. Don't be afraid. The next time he came, he brought more honey and wild orchids. He placed a round basket with a lid clamped down with a big rope twisted into a fine loop at little Ailey's feet. The basket hopped about and said, Ki Ki. Little Ailey said, Open, open, Cheta. He raised his chin at her, For you, for you. So she opened it. Two round button eyes stared into hers. She lifted the little brown baby monkey into her arms. He nestled into her neck and clutched her dress collar, then her ears and her hair. He probably thought she was his amma. The old man smiled, showing his yellow teeth and pink gums. For you, for you. He probably thinks it's your kin, little Ailey, said Mathuchin uncle who was visiting. Little Ailey stuck her tongue out at him. The next day, the baby monkey's mother appeared, distraught, yelling and kikiing, swinging from tree to tree. I want my baby back. And the monkey child abandoned his foster mother's lap and the fruit and milk beside him, leaped through the open window of the dining room and fled to his mother. Little Ailey, the abandoned surrogate mother, watched till the hurt inside rose into her throat and eyes, and she could only see hazy shadows through her tears. As fitted together, they disappeared into the forest. There's much about her childhood here, which I won't go into, but we have a very elaborate massage system in Kerala. So those of you who choose to visit there, and I can see Susie smiling. I think she tried it once or twice. Um, so there's a little scene in which there is this massage uh, where her mother, and it also sets the scene about the disconnect she has with her mother, uh, which the book will un uh, unfolds as it goes along. Big House, that's the name where little Lely grew up, settled into its regular routine the day after the elections. Kuti Gauri and Tracy, as usual, handled the weekly oil bath ritual. Rub in the warm, scented oil, coax it into soft skin, scrub it off with soft walnut bark and warm water, press the soft, thin towels over the damp body, and sprinkle sandalwood powder. Little Lely watched. Her mother lay on the mat, eyes closed. 
Her hair, which the women had loosened from its plait, lay in a black cloud. They lifted one limb after another, and when they finished, let it fall back, silky, shiny, with a film of oil. They tried to turn her with grunts and pulls, and when she did not respond, prodded her gently till she obliged. Next would be her turn, but hers was a mini version, fortunately. Little Ailey sat by with her monkey Raman, who jumped off her shoulder and skittered over the mats. He stuck his qu quivering nose into the oil pot and licked the oil with his inquisitive pink tongue. Hey monkey, get off your disgusting greedy thing. Kuti, throw the oil out and pour some fresh oil. Tracy swat knocked the monkey sideways. He is not dirty, <coughs> Tracy Chedthi. You are dirty, mouth always full of evil pan. Little Ailey clutched the chattering ramen to her chest. He swung behind and clung to her neck and peeped around, spitting out the coconut oil onto her neck. Don't talk to Tracy like that. Her grand aunt appeared, Kunju and Kajma out of nowhere, and looked sternly at little Ailey. But, and put that monkey back in the monkey house. He's pulled the clothes off the line, and Gauri and the girls had to wash them again. He's a real nuisance. Take him back to his cage and come back for your oil bath. Little Ailey, I am talking to you. Only Velichin stood between her and all this torture. But where was he? Tears popped out of her eyes and she glanced again at her mother who lay on her back, eyes closed, languorous and half asleep. The fine towel bound round her breasts left her neck and shoulders bare and reached above her knees. In the filtered sunlight of the sheltered semi-closed courtyard, her warm body absorbed the thick herbal oils. Her skin shone, it caught the light and held it, and the lights, light seeped beneath the top layer and spread over her body. One day, her mother would open her eyes, lift her head, straighten her shoulders and say, leave her alone. I will tell her what to do and what not to do. But till she did, till she did that, the whole, would, whole world would see it fit to command and bully and shout at her. Apart from the monkey obsession, <laughs> another obsession that she had, she somehow believed that she had a little brother and he was somewhere and she was always searching for him. And she imagined him in all sorts of places and she felt she had seen him in her dreams, in reality, and there was no getting away by telling her that there was no brother. Little Lely saw the baby again in the fourth jar of salt mangoes. They salted mangoes in April. They opened the first jar in July. The furious monsoon swept over the island, over Kalim, and fresh food was hard to come by. Now Big House feasted on the dried fish, smoked meat and pickles, and preserves put by during the months of plenty. Tracy used salt mango for chutney. My mouth always waters when I come to this. <laughs> she chopped the sliced cheeks and left the seed. She mixed crushed peeled shallots, coarse sea salt and green chilies with the mango pieces. She poured freshly ground coconut oil, slightly warmed in a shallow pan on the wood fire over it all and gave the mud pot a good shake. That's all little Ailey needed to eat a mountain of rice. More often, Tracy curried the mango slices. She simmered it in thick coconut milk and poured the spluttering mustard, curry leaves and red chilies on top and closed the lid tight. She opened the pot at the dining table. Little Ailey sniffed. Mmm. She had enjoyed the aroma as much as the curry itself. Now, no longer. She wouldn't touch the salt mango dishes anymore. Were these mangoes from the fourth jar? The baby floated to the top. The baby was mango colored and its head was like a mango, plump and swollen. His eyes half closed and contemplative like Confucius. His arms float in the tide of salt water and the chilies and ginger bits orbited around him like planets around the sun. The umbilical cord coiled free, long, uncut. His tiny, perfect hands waved to her as he swirled in his briny home. <coughs> there is no baby in the mango jar, 
Damodaran held the trembling child close. See, Mole, just mangoes. Look. But the child could not be consoled. If the baby wasn't in the mango jar, where was it? The baby who wailed so loudly and for such a short time that night. They left her alone after she threw up over the dining table. Metama had put the salt mango chutney in her plate. It's something she has to deal with, her grand aunt said. Leave her be, Mary. The search for the brother goes on right to the end. Uh, when you read the book, you'll understand why it happens and how there is no consolation and there is no resolution right to the end of the book. Apart from it being a family story and a story about four women, three of whom were in the patriarchal uh, gra grasp of the relatives, it's also about the feudal system um, of the haves and the have-nots because the estates and the paddy fields could not exist without having a large free working force. It reminds me of the cotton picking in the south in the 1860s and before. The economy couldn't exist unless they had large numbers of people whom they said were happy enough and they were looked after well enough <coughs> and they were people who were, they were, their children were there, their grandchildren were there and they just existed without any rights of their own. They were given food and shelter and they were a parallel uh, family to the family of big house but slowly the rebellion starts with the reading of Karl Marx and the 1950s and 60s you have a revolution with the overthrowing of the land landed gentry so this is a bit about how it begins the harvest boats arrived at the appointed time midway between the monsoons. The queen appeared around the bend. Her gilded torso cut through the still kanya. Little Ailey squinted into the distance, mouth dry. She couldn't call out a welcome. There, in the newborn sun's demi-light, treasures piled high on her ample deck, she led the others towards a landing at Big House. No cloud crept up to cover the site. River caravans, boat after boat, maneuvered their heavy cargo around the bend. Each called, Wallam, Wallam. The first one docked, then the second, till all eight lay like primeval creatures, beached by the banks alongside the steps leading to Big House. Wallam, Wallam. The shouting, the excitement, the bustle and noise and rejoicing, only in her own head. The surrounding silence crept upon her. She turned. Damodaran and many others stood back near the Maidan steps, their arms folded, their heads thrown back. The boatmen came out, secured the boats, threw the bamboo poles on the grass and went towards them. Whispers, louder whispers. Then the boatmen stood with them. Let's see how the hegemon of Big House unloads his harvest without us. Little Ailey ran to Damo. Take her away, he said. He pried her fingers from his arm and pushed her towards Amani. Go. But Amani didn't want to go either. They inched towards the stairs from the Maidan. Grandfather stood at the top of the stairs. Could he climb down? Metama handed him his cane. He leaned on it, taking step by step with his left leg like a child. The right one followed, stiff, useless. <clears throat> what is it? What's the trouble? He looked into the distance. The boats lay still. The harvest lay upon them. All the boats in? Unload! Oh, grandfather. He stared at the silent men. Damodaran stepped forward to face him. Damodaran, unload! Damodaran grabbed the slashing cane inches above his head. Crack! He splintered it against his thigh. He threw it in front of the disbelieving crowd. As a man, they stared at the demolished rod and exhaled. Ah! Grandfather turned. He leaned on Metama, and it took a century for them to get to the top of the stairs, across the garden, up the veranda to his room. After hundreds of years, the worm had turned. The news spread like Chinese whispers. 
Papachan of Big House retreated before the silent strength of the Peliyars. Times have changed. Now what? Velichan returned from Vayu that afternoon. He stood on the opposite bank for a while. No Vallam went from the island to fetch him. No one sent a boy or two to carry his briefcase and hold the umbrella over his lordly head. He stepped into the sole Vallam bombing on the, bobbing on the whispering Kanya on the other side and rode across. He got off, his, off the boat, his gun, his .22, slung carelessly over his left shoulder. He looked at the laden harvest boats. He ran up the steps from the bank. He paused at the top and called, not softly, not loudly. Damodrin, Ausep, Thoma, Johanna, unload the harvest, it may rain. Put it all under cover before it does. Johanna, tell Tracy to put back lunch by two hours. It will be done by then. He nodded to the men, waved to little Ailey and strode into the house. The gang unwound like keyed mechanical toys. They ran toward the boat. All except the Amodrin Lu looked after them in despair, wrenched off his headcloth, flung it on the ground and walked away. The others found their voices. They returned to the work they had done for hundreds of years. The harvest was unloaded by two o'clock, lunch eaten, and the empty boats rocked lightly on the Kanya. But it was a pyrrhic victory. There was nowhere to put the harvest. The rice house, which would house it, lay on the ground. A mess of wood, plaster, brass and rusty nails. Amid this shambles lay the pieces of the heavy door made of Burma teak that the forebears had brought all the way to Kalam. Indestructible, he had believed it to be. Now it lay on the ground, hacked by old, young, male and female hands. Its solid wood defied destruction, but countless dents and slashes had bitten into its once glossy surface. Beside it lay scattered, half hidden amid the debris, sickles, machetes, axes, hoes and knives. Two weeks later, the war ended. They killed Veli. Now I come to the last bit which is a circular thing when we come to the back frame, when she's at the end of this book, towards the end of the book, when she comes back, where, she, where we left her at the tomb. So we are back to that scene, and that will be the last piece I'm going to read. How long had Elizabeth sat on the tombstone with her dead? The tears had long dried. The warmth from the tomb seeped into her flesh, into her bones. She patted the rough edges of the stone. Much of what happened was filtered through her child's eyes, but the essence had distilled into her. She touched the warm stone. One day I will lie here, Ailey. I don't have all the answers. It doesn't matter. Me and mine together, safe in this tomb below the earth. The three Ailies shifted, sighed, and their dust flew up and surrounded her like armor. Go, our beloved child, and live on for all of us. The time of big house was over for me as soon as Velichan was buried here. My grand aunt before him. My mother became this strange efficient machine, tidying up and cutting vegetables, sewing clothes, doing good deeds, bandaging wounds, swishing about, exhausting. I want it all back. But here they are, all here, dust moats. I wish I could believe that they're all up there in the clouds, interwoven like Persian tapestry. Kajuraho murals, cave paintings of Ajanta and Alora, set in tiny stitches of vegetable dyes, caught forever, so I never have to lose them. And Ram and my monkey, two caught in mid swing between sky and tree. Good evening, everyone. Wasn't that wonderful? Let's give her a hand, folks. Hi, my name is Sri Srinivasan, and I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's my pleasure to uh, spend a few minutes here uh, having a conversation with Renu and then opening this up to all of you. What a wonderful setting this is to be at the Strand to talk about Kerala in this book. And I think we also need to give Anu Arun Shivdasani a round of applause for all the work that she does to promote <laughs> South Asian culture all over New York. 
she has two dance festivals. If you're wondering why it's called the indoor festival, because she already had her outdoor dance festival <laughs> last weekend. And the date for the big literary festival, which is being opened by Salman and, um, and Suketu, is uh, October 21st to 23rd. Uh, 22nd to 25th, uh, please look up IACC.us to, uh, uh, to uh, see, uh, and, and you can book your tickets and stuff. So please do that. So I'm going to do three things, I hope, in the few minutes we have together. Uh, one is talk a little bit about the book with uh, Renu and get her thoughts on uh, some of the questions that I have and then get your questions. Also, talk a little bit about Kerala. I think you did a great job of, uh, of um, raising some of the questions and we can maybe explain a little more to the audience. And then also, I know the, a group like this always has people who want to be writers themselves. So here we have a professor of creative writing from one of the best schools in India. So you'll get a chance to, I'll tease out some tips from her and thoughts about being a writer as well. So first, let's talk about um, the book. How long did this take you to, to write it? And uh, uh, you said you've been procrastinating and getting everything together, but what's and what's the what's the um, uh, response been in in India and in Kerala in particular? I took about eight years to write it. Mm -hmm. um, Some people take a lifetime, so that's okay. yes, I know. Yeah. It, it was a fag end of my career that I've written this book, and it was mainly because <laughs> because my students said, "And ma'am, what have you written?" <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I better produce something for them. In Kerala, I had a similar book reading, mm -hmm. and my whole fa I, I have 86 first cousins. I come from a huge <laughs> joint family. Yes, they multiplied by you know, like crab. Uh, uh, my father's one of 12 and my mother's one of nine. And they all had lots of kids. So, so uh, that was more than enough to fill up the hall. <laughs> um, and, and their uh, kids and their families. And their and kids them. and their families. Some are in the tomb below the, uh, the ground, some are up above and so on. So it was a very warm response. Though I don't know how many have really read the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, as, as you were putting the book together, you chose deliberately not to use the names of actual places. Some of the places are real and some are made up. Why did you choose that device? Because it's, not un it's, it's fairly unusual to do that. Even in a novel, normally the places are authentic, the names are authentic. Why did you choose to do that? I took a leaf from Marquez. Mm -hmm. Mokondo. Sure. So I wanted to write about uh, Kerala, mm -hmm. but I wanted to twist it around and, and um, make some changes geographically, a little bit, very little. Otherwise, the description of Kerala, which is in the book, mm -hmm. of, of Devanadi, which is in this book, Devanadi means God's gift, and Kerala is called God's own country. Right. So it was a slim thing. That's why I did it, so that I didn't want it to be actual Kerala. I didn't want... Um, but why, why, was that? why was that? I didn't want to stick to the fact to the geographical okay. facts, but in the end I did. Mm -hmm. the, the north that is populated by the Maplas and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just wanted to make up my own names, mm -hmm. uh, which I found, uh, like Kanya, the river on which the island is and so on. Uh, it means a virgin, so it is a virgin island created by the river. Right. So I just spent all poetic. <laughs> well, what are some other cities that show up in different, or names that might be familiar to some folks? Malar for Malabar. Okay. Uh, Cheri for Chendangiri, mm -hmm. um, Kalam for Kotim. So these were all uh, very similar to the names. And then I chose old estate houses. We had, a, you know, when the British had um, uh, constructed all the plantations. So Heartsease Estate, these were the old British names. So I've chosen some of them for the book. And of course, Arun asked the most important question, how much of this is bio autobiographical or among your 86 cousins, how many of them show up here? I heard many stories when I was a child growing up. We never sat down to less than 20 at a meal. It is all, the house was always full of people. So I heard several stories and I used to listen in on the gossip after I was supposed to be asleep. So I heard some <laughs> stories uh, and, uh, and it, things happen when there's a joint family with a huge um, uh, servant population parallel to the whole uh, family as well, visitors. We used to have 20, 30 children in the holidays swimming in the river and so on. So much of the background and setting is things I have experienced. But every character has been created by me. Every character has been created by me. 
um, some of the situations, some of the conversations, some of the dialogue, perhaps is some things I may have heard and retained. By osmosis, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but the characters are not real. And let's talk a little bit about Kerala because you started to set the scene for the the way in which the communists of India, uh, of Kerala, you know, the, the communist uh, government became the first uh, democratically elected communist government in the world. It's almost a, right. an oxymoron, yes. but that happened there. That's right. uh, what, what do you attribute to, to that having happened in Kerala? And even today, obviously, uh, uh, you know, people like Marx and, and Lenin are revered in parts of Kerala. Yes. Che Guevara too. Yeah. Um, well, that's on the Columbia campus yes. too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I grew up, the staff who were, I, I didn't know the difference between family and staff at the time when I was a little child. I remember many of them were reading Karl Marx in Malayalam. This was just before the final election which I've written about in the book, whereby they outvoted the landed gentry mm. and they came in. I attributed to education. Uh, the Kerala government put all its money into education. Uh, which is why we are so many miles behind develop economic development behind other states. But you won't see an, uh, a child uneducated in Kerala. And Kerala is like East Europe to a large extent. Um, the state looks after its own very well, the bankrupt state, but it looks after the, the people very well indeed. So I, I keep thinking about Greece when I think about Kerala very often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the pluses and the minuses. Mm -hmm. So so in, in, in terms of uh, that backdrop, that probably made it very easy for you to be able to tell the story. Yes, I remember as a child, mm -hmm. everyone going to, to vote. And I always thought, if everyone's going to vote this way, how come they won? Right. So obviously, uh, they were voting for whoever they wanted. So your family was talking about voting yes, for the Yes, and they gentry, bullied yeah. the servants and right. said, you jolly well yeah. vote for, but they of course <laughs> voted for whoever they wanted. Right. And then there was some violence in the, in where my uncles had estates. Mm -hmm. There were some murders mm -hmm. um, and uh, people used whatever uh, weapons they had at hand and then it became a bloody revolution to some extent in some parts of mm -hmm. Kerala. Otherwise it was a peaceful election, mm -hmm. uh, one fairly. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about your own writing. Uh, as a teacher of creative writing, what did you learn about yourself in putting this book together? I found how tough it is to write and I won't be so be jollying my students along <laughs> like I used to do before. I'll have great empathy for them. It's really, a, it ju when you sit down to write, nothing comes uh -huh. very often. Right. Um, and then you come to the end of the book and you say that you've left out va vast chunks yeah. and the reader doesn't have a clue what's going on. Yeah. So you have to go back and write the backstory and connect people up. And then characters want to do things that uh, you, they, you don't want them to do and then you have to write the story around that. It's very, very difficult and then there are people and then you, the, because I read a lot as a child in a convent school, it's, uh, the writing is a little more British, it's not current, so I read a lot of American novels, uh, it, it, it isn't a current uh, American way of writing, it is more as if it's translated from the Malayalam because I thought a lot in Malayalam when I wrote it. Mm. So some people may find that uh, not so easy to read. And I chose to leave the Malayalam names as is without giving footnotes and without giving explanations and without using italics um, because I felt it is self-explanatory. So when I say Vallam, I, I know that you got it that it was a boat. It's not a canoe, it's not a boat, it's a dugout which is peculiar to Kerala. So if I use any other term, it would be misleading. Yeah. So I left it as Valla. Right, well, this is a question that um, I, I thought a lot about when I read Malayalam books set in Kerala, but in English, is how much do you translate? And if you remember, The God of Small Things was set in and around some of the same geography. Same. And it, you know, it was such a successful book and it had a glossary where they would have words like mittam, which they would describe as a kind of front yeah. yard. But to a Malayali like us, it means something very specific, just like vallam means something very specific. Yeah. So how do you deal with that, that in the sense that you're leaving some information to the reader's imagination and they may pick the wrong thing to fill in the gap as opposed to what you wanted to fill in? 
this is a risk I took. Uh -huh. But I thought it would spoil the book if I gave explanations. Hmm. If I said Vallam, comma, <laughs> the dugout made from the tamarind tree, <laughs> I thought, you know, the, the reader would lose. The, and by the time I've used Vallam three times, they've got, right. they've got it. Right. And, uh, it. And I've used inter intermittently the duck boat mm -hmm. for Vallam as well. Mm -hmm. Duck boats are little ones which you use to herd ducks on the river. Mm -hmm. So I've used that term as well right. later. So I hope, I debated a lot and my publishers were not amused at all. But I just <laughs> went along with what I thought uh, I should do. And uh, I have, most readers haven't grumbled. Some have, mm -hmm. mainly my family, but <laughs> most uh, haven't uh, grumbled about it. So. All right, let's open this up for questions. I know there are folks here who have, who have questions for Renu. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Thomas, yeah. First of all, I think between the Greeks and between between Greeks and Malayalis, Keralites, I think we pay more tax than anybody anybody else in India. <laughs> Secondly, I uh, just wanted to tell you that uh, I like the title. I have three alias in my own life, my mother, my sister and my daughter. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you, I am looking forward to read the book, uh, but from your reading, uh, see, the whole Syrian Christian community revolves around church and priest, and you have not touched anything at all in this book. Uh, you'll have to read the book. Uh, there's a very wicked bishop in it. <laughs> <laughs> that may not have been what he was looking for, but okay. That's, uh, but but uh, we should also use this opportunity to explain the Syrian Christians. Y yes. Uh, you, um, you, you made a joke, it's not nothing to do with ISIS, but it's really important for people um, to understand yes. that, that St. Thomas, the St. Thomas, one of the yes. apostles, came, as you said earlier. First century he, AD. He's, 52 he's AD. reputed to have come in 42 AD, which is 52. nine years after the birth of Christ. That's right. right. Yeah, That's so right. And he's supposed to have... Um, um, uh, he is, uh, he converted the people and the Orthodox strain, as you know, uh, and very ritualistic. The Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, very similar. Long beards, censers, a lot of statues. Catholics, uh, Roman Catholics, so it, it, it's the uh, same strain of, of the churches, so it's the uh, unreformed church um, which I grew up in uh, with confession and uh, high drama and uh, uh, lots of stuff going on and my family were extremely religious so I had a lot of it uh, to contend with, yeah. So is it? Okay, let's go with more questions. Did you have the experience as a writer of your characters running off on their own? Is that something that that um, enriched the experience for you or frightened you? I mean, did they take on lives of their own? Or did you feel you were always in total control? I didn't feel I was in control to a large extent. And there are certain things in the book which was it was the tragic parts. I would have preferred that it didn't happen that way. But that's the way it happened. So you're right. They do tend to draw you into their own lives. But at the end of the story, I put them to bed. I don't want to write a sequel or anything more. I'm done. <laughs> but you are working on a second novel. Yes, but, but it's a something different totally story. different. Totally yeah. different. Okay. Others, yes. Hi, Sada. Um, I am from Karnataka, the neighbor state, and we grew up, uh, you know, always believing uh, that it was, Kerala was a matriarchal society, women were very powerful in Kerala. Always was, you know, we always said, okay, why can't the whole of India be like that? Why can't, you know, we, of course we've heard of the education, right? And women, strong women. And they had a lot of say in what was happening. But when, when you made comments now, it seemed like that's not really true. Yes, you're talking about the Menons? The Nayars, yeah. The Nayars? Yeah. The uh, certain Hindu communities who have the matriarchal system. And matrilineal. Matrilineal the, yeah, too, so the where they inherit. property passed through, so my, my family, we're, we're Nayars and our family passed, the property passed through the girls in the family. So the most important person in your life, man in your life is your uncle. Maternal uncle is almost more important than your father, yeah, so. And in this book, the maternal, the uncle is very important. 
in the life of the little girl in a different way. Uh, but this is a totally different community. We belong to a patriarchal system where we do not inherit. My husband belongs to, and my sister-in-law here, they belong to a, a community which is matriarchal and the women have equal rights as the men. In ours, it took Arundhati Roy's mother a court case to get us uh, the, the legal standing to inherit her father's property. Otherwise, we were given dowries, and the more stingy your father is, the less dowry you get. <laughs> and you are sent away with nothing. So this, this is why this book is about this community. Are there a couple of more questions? Yeah. Can I tell us Sure, my name is Sumit, and um, I'm not a, a writer or, or teacher in English, but, but I do teach. So I just have a question which um, many of you might find irrelevant, but I was curious about how the thoughts, when, when a writer writes something that's very descriptive, full of imagery, um, my question is what, how the mechanics of the thoughts work before producing that sentence. So for example, when you describe the monkey and, and the tasting of the oil, so I noticed that instead of just saying the monkey's tongue, you said the monkey's inquisitive pink tongue. So when that happens, is it, uh, most writers, is it just sort of, sort of a first pass, that's how it comes out when you write it, or is it that you write the, the tongue first, and then there's a second or third draft where you embellish it further. How does that usually work? That particular sentence, I had a monkey when I was growing up. <laughs> and I pictured him, and I picture, pictured his tongue. And that's how it came about, I think. <laughs> but much of writing is rewriting. So the first draft, um, if you see, it, there's a lot of it I have discarded. Uh, much of the wordiness has been abandoned and you pick out words and you substitute words, you read aloud and you insert it and each paragraph took a long, long time to get it to the final shape. So it's not that it flows as pink inquisitive tongue at all. It comes perhaps as a pink tongue which then sounds cliched and then uh, what was the tongue doing? It was probing so you, then you think of inquisitive and sometimes a perfect phrase comes out and sometimes it eludes you and then you abandon that and leave it as just plain prose. Who are the writers that inspire you and who do you teach in your classes? Um, I do workshops where they're supposed to do the readings on their own. So I don't have uh, uh, set readings apart from excerpts. Marquez is one of my favorites. Um, Haruki, um, uh, Harak Harakami. Mura Haruki Murakami, yeah. sorry. Then I like the British writers like Kate Atkinson very much. Um, and of course, um, Jumpaleri I have read. Uh, my book was, is not an immigrant book, as you have seen, like <laughs> hers is, because I have no immigrant experience. It is a book of someone who's born and brought up and who lives in India. So um, I, I've read a lot. Uh, from childhood. Um, I don't remember now. I've read all the, the um, Paul Auster and all the New York writers um, and a lot of the British authors and the, the Russian masters. Um, uh, and at the moment um, I'm reading William Trevor who's a, an Irish writer whom I'm very fond of. But because having studied in an Irish convent, a lot of my reading has been British classics. Sure. Okay, let's do one more question. Did you feel empowered after writing the book? I felt quite distraught because I felt I, it was the job is over. Then I realized it wasn't. I had to trot around marketing it. <laughs> so that was something that I'm not used to. I mean, as a teacher, you stand up there and you teach and everyone listens to you, at least in India they do. And uh, so I thought that it was over, but it wasn't. <laughs> and um, my publishers are small, they didn't have much of a reach, so I had to go around and uh, uh, read and discuss and so on. Uh, and I kept thinking about its voyage, whether people were getting to read it, uh, and I wanted it to fall into kind hands 
you know, so that people won't tear it to bits. Uh, it's like setting a small orphan child out into the road, I think. So I, I was happy when it was over and I sent it off for the final thing. Though there is no final because it's gone into the second publishing with some changes. Uh, so now I hope I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> and you can concentrate on the second book. <laughs> let's, let you have, sorry, one more, yeah, sir. I happened to be at the Lit Fest in Calcutta when uh, Renu did a reading towards the end of January earlier this year. And I can say that she didn't have to worry about it because it was a packed audience that gave her a standing ovation after the reading. Wonderful. Thank you, Gopi. <laughs> so on that happy note, we'll conclude this part of the conversation, but I hope you'll come and talk to her, get your book signed by her, there are books on sale in the back, and of course all the wonderful food from our friends at Awad that has just come out here. So please go get some food and come say hi. Thanks everybody. Good night. And, go, and come to the Literary Festival and the Dance Festival. Yeah.